Hey again, good morning, everybody. Welcome back to our Sunday morning service here at the Anchorage Baptist Church. Kind of left everybody hanging, or not everybody, left a few people hanging uh, when we ended up our Thursday night service uh, with Hebrews chapter 3, verse 6. But, you know, for those that are speakers, uh, maybe there's a preacher out there uh, or somebody who has been a preacher, uh, there's so many different ways to come from the word of God, you know, to present Jesus. And it just can't be taken care of, you know, the, the whole sum uh, of even one verse, the whole sum of one verse uh, can't be covered in the time frame. Uh, even if you're Pastor James and, and, you, and you enjoy an hour and a half to two hours, wouldn't that be great? <clears throat> These things still can't be covered. Uh, and so in this endeavor to be back in the book of Hebrews, my my favorite book. Um, it was a little bit different. I was trying to keep it, trying to follow, of course, always the leading of the Holy Spirit. Uh, but years ago, I, I went through Hebrews, and it took 24 hours. There were 24 messages that came out, and that's just a lot. You know? <laughs> Nobody wants to listen to me for 24 hours, so um, I'm trying to get through this uh, quicker, and I'm and I'm that is still my heart's desire, but I I do have to follow leading the Holy Spirit, uh, and as we start again, yeah, we are going to be in just a second over in Hebrews three, <clears throat> verse six, but we've got to keep in mind there's a context here. This is for anybody who is business oriented, you know, location, location, location. Well, in the Word of God, context, 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 because. There are some verses, as I've said many times, that stand on its own. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That verse will stand uh, on its own. Peter's, you know, 1 Peter 1, 9, receive the end of your faith, even the salvation of your soul. That verse, too, will stand on its own. But there's other verses. Uh, in one of my earlier messages, somebody made a comment um, I, because I just have this thing the Lord on the inside of me that when I have an opportunity to talk about once saved, always saved or eternal life, I do. I think it's the most important topic out there uh, for me. Uh, and uh, I think for a lot of people. Uh, so I cover it. And so somebody quoted uh, Hebrews for it. If you're here today, uh, man, you know, it's context. What you quoted has nothing to do with what I was talking about. And so many people that take uh, Hebrews 6 out of context might even come close to suicide. And that verse has nothing to do with loss of salvation. I mean, nothing at all. In fact, it really is outside of salvation. Salvation is included in on it. We'll talk about it when we get to it. Uh, but when you quote Verses like that and not know what you're talking about, it, it, it does a disservice uh, to the word of God. And that's why it's so important for us to context, context, context uh, with these things. And who, who was that person that almost killed themselves? That was me. I was high. I was on drugs and I was reading Hebrews 6. And when I read that it's impossible for those who are once enlightened and, and come to know the Lord and the glory and all those things that Hebrews 6 is talking about, that if they shall fall away to renew themselves themselves again, uh, uh, to repentance. And ah! I, knew I, I knew I was lost. I knew I lost my salvation. And I came this close. I mean, I came just millimeters. And I am not a suicidal person. That, that's the only time I've ever felt I should you know, kill myself. I, I don't have, thank you, Lord. I don't have that bend in my life, but I almost killed myself because I thought I thought I threw it all away. Just a baby Christian who, you know, just in the wrong place and wrong spot. And but the Lord used that. So the book of Hebrews was written to these first century Hebrews who are being excommunicated from their families. <clears throat> They're losing their jobs. <clears throat> They're being thrown out of synagogues. They're trying to find places to fellowship in. Uh, they're under persecution uh, by many people. Again, family members. It, it's just a mess for them. And so the author of Hebrews, uh, God put it on that author's heart uh, to write these things because 
there was such a pull to just give up. It's not worth it. But brothers and sisters, we have this blessing. God allowed this in what uh, the what Christian dumb calls the canon of Scripture. Uh, God wanted this book, Hebrews, uh, not just for the Hebrews, but for us also, because we're, we're somewhat, please, no letters, okay? Uh, we are spiritual Jews. Uh, we are grafted in. We're adopted into the family. Uh, and uh, so uh, these things are important to us also. But there's a context for all these things. And the reason that nobody knows the author of Hebrews is because God is the author. The Holy Spirit is. And at the very beginning, verse 1 of chapter 1 and verse 2, is God speaking and God telling the Jews that God's doing something different now, okay? It's not coming through the prophets anymore. It's not coming through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's not coming through the judges. It's not coming through Moses. It's not coming through Aaron anymore, that God is now speaking to us through his son, and if we don't have the son, we don't have anything because the carnal mind, if we're not born again, the carnal mind can't receive the things of the Lord, no matter who you talk to. It doesn't matter. That, that's why, and I, I quoted in the last service, uh, why in the first chapter of First Corinthians, God said, I made sure that the world that doesn't know Jesus would never find him in their wisdom. They would only find that verse. I think it's 19. God says, the world is never going to find Jesus in the universities. He's never going to find, the world is never going to find Jesus in anything except the proclaiming, Teruso, the, the proclamation of God's word. But that word has to come out straight. The word can't be violated to try and justify it. The word can't be twisted to make it sound better or different. God doesn't need us to dust it. God doesn't need to clean it off. His word is clean. There's nothing we have to do to it except adhere ourselves to that and have a heart's desire to do that. So God is speaking to these first century Jews who are under persecution like we've not. Well, maybe we've experienced a little bit of this, but this is overall, this is just a, a massive thing that's going on. So he's telling them that God used to speak through these people. So don't worry about it because now he's speaking through his son. And then he goes into talking about something that would instantly get the Jews' attention, and that's angels, because they are cool. I mean, they are, you know, one thing the Jews knew about from the Old Testament were angels. That's how God spoke to his people with Abraham, Isaac, uh, Jacob, uh, Moses. The angels gave the law. I know God passed over them, but it was angels uh, that gave the law, the moral law and the, cer and the ceremonial law uh, to, uh, to Moses. And, and so angels are a huge deal. And the writer here was making an argument or making a, a, a dialect, a discussion uh, that Jesus was made better than angels or that, that Jesus was better than angels but that God made him, when he came to earth, a little lower than angels. You know, God was, Jesus was his son, the son of God, okay, not just a prophet, not, not, not these other wonderful people that we read about uh, in the Old Testament, but God is now the son, he's the head honcho, and that, he brings that out in the first two chapters here, uh, and he goes on to let them know, but God made his son for us, a little lower. He, he made him human so that the things that Jesus was going to go through and pass those tests that God, it's unbelievable to think that when that God tested his son, you know, again, we, we believe it because it's what the word says, but, you know, trying to get our head around that isn't always the easiest thing. Uh, and so God tested his son. His son passed the test. And that's why when he, you know, he, he was driven into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit, Mark says. But when he came out, he came out in the power of the Spirit. Why? Because he defeated the devil. He said, get thee behind me. He didn't buy into him. Even when Satan came and twisted the word and took it out of context to try and prove something, Jesus said, no, -uh, that's not what it says. 
And even when the devil says, I can give this power to anybody, how many of us will just jump on board and say, oh, I want to be, I want to be a, I want to be a whore and a whoremonger. I'm sorry. I want to be an actor or an actress. Oh, I want to be a politician. I want to boss people around. I want to tell people, you know, what to do. No. That's what this is all about. But a lot of Christians, you know, I, I don't have to speak for the world. The world lost. As I've said a million times, you can't get another demon into an unsaved person with a crowbar. Okay, they're lost. They're under the wrath of God. No matter how nice they are, or, you know, how philopanthric they are, you know, no matter what they're doing, they're lost. They don't know God. Their minds are not converted. They think with a carnal mind. And the carnal mind can come up with some really interesting things, but not from God. One of the biggest problems that happened to Job's friends is that they used their carnal mind instead of listening to God. They used their reasoning of, of how they knew God. Uh, and, and that's what God must be doing in their life, in, J in Job's life, except God wasn't doing those things because they weren't spiritually attuned. Okay, so moving on. Uh, so uh, coming out of verse two, uh, you know, we see that. Um, Let's look at verse, get this in the proper context. Uh, verse 16 of chapter 2, that Jesus took on, uh, for verily, Jesus took not on himself the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Now, that you again, you mentioned the seed of Abraham. We may have to go back and read. You know, we may have to page through something to, to familiarize ourselves, you know, with the seed of Abraham. But the Jews knew this. And so, again, when this is being spoken, now, these are born-again people. Now, I'm sure there's lost people, you know, uh, that the Lord's brought into these churches, maybe a converted synagogue uh, to Jesus. So there's probably lost people there, too. But this is written to born-again people, okay? This is written to Christians. And Christians can't lose their salvation. And I'll show you that in just a minute. Uh, and so... Uh, he didn't take on himself the nature of angels, but he took on himself the nature, the seed of Abraham. It's a big deal to the Jews. Wherefore, in all things, it behooved him to be made like, it behooved Jesus to be made like unto his brethren, so that he might be able to be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining God. I may be wrong, but I think this is the first time in Hebrews where the word high priest is brought up. But if you have your Bibles open, you'll notice that the high priest is not capitalized. Okay. It's just a reference. It's just a, oh yeah, you remember the high priest? You know, it wasn't talking specifically about them. I mean, sorry, it wasn't talking, uh, it, it was it was referencing them, just like in the Old Testament, uh, God a couple times is referenced as a father, but not a capital F, just the characteristics of a father. In the New Testament, it's capital F. He's our father. Big difference. That's why all those Old Testament names for God, listen, you like them, praise the Lord. You quote them, you use them for what, praise the Lord. That's between you and God. But the only, the only thing that matters right now is God, the Father, and his son, Jesus Christ. That's it. For you simple-minded people out there, you don't have to know about Yahweh and Yah and, and, and why they take the O out of God and, you know, the, the, the Messianic Jews. And you don't need to know that stuff, okay? That's cool, but it doesn't get any closer to God. And if you're like me, I don't need extra stuff in my life, you know, to get me to God. You know, in fact, I need to get off as much stuff, you know, to make it a little sleeker uh, for me. I think that's a lot of us, but moving on. So Jesus became, it says that, uh, that it behooved him to be made like a human being so that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. And that reconciliation I mentioned is over 2 Corinthians 5.17. that tells us that old things have passed away. When we become born again, everything else becomes new. There's a new life for us uh, anymore. And, you know, uh, heard on in one of the testimonies and everything, you know, the, 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 uh, the cultures uh, that are out there, you know, and, and, you know, the different things that are going on. You know, there's there's 
in humanity, there's only one blood. And our cultures now should not have an influence on our walk with the Lord. Okay. And it's not a black white thing. It's not, it's not a Spanish, Puerto Rican, Mexican uh, type thing. You know, it's not a Persian Arab type thing that's going on. That's the devil just, just doing what he can to keep everybody separate. It's what Jesus is doing in our life right now, whoever we are, because no matter what culture you were raised in, you are now a brother and a sister to me and to everybody else. And you're a child of God. And God doesn't have any, any, God is God. And we're not that anymore. All things have passed away. Hey, bring your, bring the culture of your food, especially in my life. Man, oh man, never had a calorie I didn't love. You know, and, and and the other neat things that come in, you know, through through different cultures. But oh yeah, you know, because I, you know, I, I'm never mind. I was gonna bring up, you know, my heritage, but one of them killed the Jews. You know, the other one are just drunkards. You know, they're they're the they're the they're the laugh at any wedding. Uh, you know, and the other one, people just weird weird themselves out with with the Bohemians that are out there. You know, so. You know, none of us in our in our human flesh are anything now. It's everything in the spirit, which is one. And, and Jesus, he's a he's a high priest in things pertaining to God. This reconciliation that God gave us, and remember that we were reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. And when we became born again, He then gave you and I the ministry of reconciliation. We can do these things talking to people about the Lord, winning them over, etc. For verse 18, and this is important, for in that he himself suffered being tempted, he is now able to help them, to be there for them that are tempted and tempted because he went through it. That's why we can look to Jesus. That, that's why our hearts can connect to him. You know, it's hard to talk to somebody. When I was, when I was a young pastor, there were people came and talked to me, and I'm sure they were shaking their head because, you know, whatever age I, I, I was when I became a pastor in my in my late 30s, I believe, uh, early four, I can't even remember now. Um, but, you know, there's experience and, and things that, you know, pe people need to know that the ones they're talking to have gone through it, you know, or, you know, I know a lot of people say they have. That's a, that's a whole nother message. But now verse three coming up here, because. What's happening here? There's there's a segue here. There, there's a very smooth transition from from God saying, "Listen to my son. Don't worry about those those old timers. Don't worry about the angels." Okay? This is what Jesus did, because wherefore, verse one, and this is this is huge. Okay, so if you're busy, stop your busyness. And pay attention, this is huge, not just for the Jews, but for us also. Verse, verse 1 of chapter 3. Wherefore, most holy people, holy brethren, he's speaking to the Jews, and now he's speaking to us also. Uh, you Jews, you partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and capitalized high priest of our profession, who is Jesus Christ? Who is Christ Jesus? Whoa. Now, again, this, this was a smooth transition from angels and, and things that were talked about in chapter 2, here in chapter 3, that now are telling the Jews that Jesus is now a high priest. So now we're bringing in Moses, we're bringing in Aaron, we're bringing in the ceremonial law, we're bringing, uh, we're bringing into the moral law, we're bringing into these things that made the Jews different from other people. Nobody else had these laws. Nobody else, and Moses to them, I mean, you know, Moses was worshipped. In fact, Moses was worshipped so much that, that remember, uh, where is it? Oh, is it in Jude? I can't remember when, uh, when. The devil was trying to dig up Moses' body because he wanted to lift him up for people to worship Moses. And God buried him. He said, Where, where'd God bury him? Yeah, well, God didn't tell anybody because he knows how he knows what kind of people we are. That's how big a deal Moses was. When he died, Satan knew, man, if I could 
if I could stuff them and raise them up on a pole somewhere, just, you know, so people could see them, they'd worship him and not the God of who Moses was trying to get people to follow. And, and Moses did all these wonderful things, man. You know, he was the deliverer. He was the lawgiver. He, he was the prophet. He, you know, he was, he was part of the, even though he wasn't directly in the Levitical law because he was before that. His brother was the head of the, uh, Aaron was uh, at that time when, when that law came. Moses still ministered in those spiritual things of God. So, I mean, he was everything to the people. Uh, and he says, so consider this Jesus who is a high priest now of this Christianity called Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him. Just as Moses was faithful in all of his house. And I mean, it's just their ears perked up. Because when you bring up Moses, you bring up God on earth. Okay? It's just us. You know? We just seem to gravitate to things that are seen. Things that we know. You know? We walk in fear for things we don't know. We, we grope around in things that we don't know, but we, we seem to gravitate to people, places, things, you know, that we know are real. So, I mean, of course, they know Moses is real. Uh, and uh, so he says that, uh, speaking of Jesus, he was faithful to him, to God, that appointed him, just as Moses was faithful in all of his house. Now, this house that, that God gave Moses wasn't just his Okaya, not just his home here on earth, but the house, but the house of all these things that God was was using him to bring people uh, out of Egypt, you know, to lead them to the promised land. This was Moses' house at that time, and Moses, in, in spite of mistakes and everything else, he was faithful uh, in these things. For this man was counted worthy. This is Jesus now. For this Jesus, this, this, you know, if you'll consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, he was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, insomuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. And that's true. And I think on Thursday, I just, it was, the, I, I was in a time crunch and I was trying to get to, uh, to six and I kind of butchered this a little bit. So, uh, so going on, you know, the word is teaching us verse four, I'm um, verse three, uh, that inasmuch as he who has built the house, he has more honor than the house itself. Because every house that is built by somebody, but letting the Jews know that he that builds all things is God. And God is now using Jesus to do this. Verse five. And truly, verily, Moses, he was faithful in all of his house as a servant, not a son, with as awesome as Moses was. You know, and you can watch Charlton Heston, and you, know, you, you can see all the things. We can read about all the things that Moses did. I, you know, when I read Moses, I'm just like, you know, why didn't you kill them all, Moses? Why don't you just kill everybody and tell God they died? I mean, to endure these people that he was trying to help as they were lying and sticking them in the back and and just baiting him and, and you know trying to trip him up and causing divisions and but he was steadfast. You now he just did what he could to get back with the Lord because the Lord had put a vision in him, just like the Lord has put a vision in every single one of us that we need to adhere to. I know there's a million other things that we can do in Christianity. But what is God doing? What is Jesus doing in your life today? You're not here by mistake. Okay. At HBC, we don't have, we don't offer anything. We don't have anything to offer. We don't have a nursery. We have a room that you can go into, you know, if you want to take care of your child in there or whatever. But, you know, we're not begging you to come. We're not petting you to get you. We're not going to tweak you to keep you. If the Lord brings you, praise the Lord. And all of us at Hagler will strive and do what we can to accept you the way you are. And hopefully you'll start to change. And if not, then, you know, other people or myself have to step in. Uh, and you don't want that because I don't want that. 
But what's the vision that the Lord has put? Because if the Lord's put a deliverance vision on you, quit running to other places and be faithful and true to that vision. So Moses, verily, he was faithful in all of his house. This is now the house here on earth for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. So, of course, everything that Moses did, these were types and shadows. These were things about what Jesus was going to be doing in our life uh, when it comes after Calvary, which changed everything. Well, actually, the resurrection changed everything, but, you know, Calvary was part of that. Uh, but Christ wasn't a servant. He was a son over his own house, whose house are we? Wow. That kind of changes everything. It's not just a movement anymore. Okay. It's not just a place of revival. Okay. I'm not saying they can't, these things can't happen in other places. But the revival that God wants in our lives needs to start in our life. And the things that God is doing in our lives is for us. The Holy Spirit is, he lives inside of you and I, each one of us, he leads and guides and provides. Yeah, we come together because the word of God teaches us to still do that. But one day, you know, the church is going to go home. It's going to be a much smaller group of people. It might even be one or two individuals. I think it'll always be two because God, has, the Lord established that uh, in the New Testament. But regardless, you know, things are going to change. And the vision we have now and the faithfulness of that vision and, and, and where we are, you know, so many people, they just want to set the world on fire for Jesus. Why don't you just take care of Jesus? Or why don't you just let Jesus take care of the things in your life right now? Well, Jesus is telling me to do this and do that. I, I double check that. Because Jesus has a lot of people in a lot of places that he doesn't need us to butt into. I'm just telling you, brothers and sisters, this is wisdom, okay? What you do with your life is between you and the Lord. But when we think that we need to be something, the Word of God says we can't be something because we're nothing. When we get to that place where we can honestly be nothing and not worry or care about what people are thinking, if we're trying to do what we can to follow, our, that's all that matters. That's where God wants the brothers and sisters. That's where he wants his family. So he can then teach, just like any mom and dad. You know, your child gets to a certain age and, you know, they know they know everything. And they let you know that they know everything. But they don't, do they? They don't know that. And you can't tell them that. And you just have to be a tough parent. Well, listen, our God is a tough God. And we can fool around and think that we're God's gift to this, that, and the other thing but we're legends in our own mind. And we bring deception and hurt to other people because God isn't always doing things that we think or that we want him to do in other places, in our things. That's why it's so important. How's Jesus in your life today? Well, my life, I got to do this, I got to do that. Mm -hmm. How's Jesus in your life today? But Jesus is a son, verse six, over his own house, whose house we are. If, oh, here it is. Oh, I hate this verse. If we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of hope firm unto the end. Oh, am I going to lose my salvation? I'm not talking anything about salvation, brothers and sisters. In fact, the next several verses are going, this is an introduction to the next several verses about what's going to happen what's going to come into their lives now that they're saved, knowing all these things from the past, how that it is so important for us that when we become born again, we follow the Lord. We don't get ahead of our supply train. We don't think that we're something when we're nothing. That when the word of God says it's wrong to do this, it means it. And, and when God doesn't want us to defile the temple, the bodies that we live in, he means it. And when the Lord tells us that, that, that wine is a mocker and strong drink is raging, whosoever is deceived by both is not wise, it's true. 
And for those that think they can fornicate or commit adultery, fellas, you blow up your soul. You bring a wound there and you wonder why you can't walk with the Lord. You got a vagabond spirit. You wander everywhere. Bible, a Bible. No, you just can't settle down where the Lord planted you. Why? Because you got demons. Because you're filled with the devil. Because you've, you've gotten away from your supply train and said, thanks a lot, God. I got it from here. And that's what's happening here. He's telling them that there's a straight and narrow, that don't worry about the angels. Don't worry about the prophets. Don't worry about Moses. Don't worry about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Don't worry about all these things from the Old Testament. The son is doing a new thing here. And when we get our eyes off the son and we get them on, we got to go here, we got to go there, we got to be involved in this, we got to be involved with that. We separate ourselves from blessings and we allow things in our lives. You know, we live in an age of grace. And so Christians just, I know I don't even do this. And hey, thank God we don't live in the days of Ananias and Sapphira, huh? That I'd be preaching to nobody. You can laugh. If you don't get it, just give, give it a second. It'll come to you. Don't worry, I wouldn't be here either. But the days of Ananias and Sapphira weren't, weren't that long ago. God has a straight and narrow for all of us. He's got, he's got a program in the New Testament that tells us what to do and what not to do. It's not talking about salvation. It's talking about what we do after we get saved. And the Lord wants us to stay, to stay faithful to the end because if not, we're going to water down our Christianity. And we're not going to be able to do things that we want. We're going to read, we're going to read material and go, wow, I'd like to be like that. And God's like, man, you threw that away years ago. Man, if you, you know, color me stupid, okay? But, you know, as I look back upon my Christianity, I mean, I always wanted to have a deeper walk with the Lord. I was deceived in a lot of areas. And, you know, the Lord delivered me, healed me, you know, of different things. But I thought the whole, I thought the whole issue of being a Christian is that you wanted to be a Christian. People get saved. And because the pulpits are silent, because the cemeteries are silent, because the Bible colleges are silent, because they don't say anything about the devil. Oh, oh you, yeah, they come out of seminary. They come out of Bible college with knowing who the devil is and, you know, knowing how to apply Isaiah and Ezekiel and, you know, know knowing about, you know, some things in Revelation. But they, they won't say a word about the devil because they're afraid. They're filled with demons themselves or they're ignorant. They're just plumb ignorant because they weren't taught anything. This is a real enemy, brothers and sisters. You know it. Because he's trying to hinder you every single day. He wants your Christianity watered down. He wants you sipping the suds. He wants you to take a little wine for your tummy's sake. He wants you to smoke dope. He wants you to smoke cigarettes. He wants you to swear and cuss. Do you know that do you know that cuss words should not come out of the mouth of a Christian? Do you know that? Evil communication, filthy communication, King James, should not come out of our mouths. Do you know spiritual adultery? How do we deal with that? Cast it down, brothers. See something, say, Father, that's that's wrong. I don't want that in my life. Put a guard on my eyes, put a guard on my mouth, put a guard on my hands. Are we praying that? Are we asking the Lord for help? Because He is a real help in time of need. Ladies, man, where are you today? Goodness gracious. So many of you are all gendered up and all, all this weird stuff going on because you want to be something that you're not. You're marking yourself all over the place for whatever reason. God doesn't want that in our lives. God's got something different. And thank God when people get saved, you know, I mean, I know several people, two specifically, they're so embarrassed. They'd wear long sleeves, you know, because they had marks on their body. They were embarrassed, so they covered them up. But as Christians, of course, if you're born again, we, we accept, because look at, yeah. <laughs> The marks that I have are things that I've allowed in my life. No different than anybody else. We accept. 
We are accepted in the beloved, the word of God says. This verse 6 says, now Jesus is a son over his own house. Whose house are we? But we need to hold fast to the confidence and rejoice in the hope firm unto the end. Or what? Or we're going to be we're going to be sails with no wind. We're going to be clouds with no rain. We're not going to be of any effect to the Lord. And the devil's going to come in and tell you how good you are, how many people like you, and oh, how wise you are, oh, how many followers you have, all oh, this great thing that God wants you to do. And there's lies. They're lies. So these next several verses are going to explain why the second half of verse 6 said this. Wherefore, as the Holy Spirit say it today, brothers and sisters, friends, Michael, if you will hear the Lord's voice, don't be obstinate, don't be stubborn, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation, in the day of tempting or proving in the wilderness. Oh, see, because tempting and proving is going to come into the life of a believer until we get home. Lord, I just love you so much. And God's going to bring something, blah, 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 you know, and a minute later, we're swearing, we're cussing, we're shaking our fists. Why doesn't God love me? He loves other people more than me. Because God's proven us. He's testing us. That's what that's what the second half of this verse is about in verse 6. It has nothing to do with salvation. It has to do with our walk. Because problems are going to come. Next person throw curses at me. Well, pray for angels around yourself. Put a lid on your garbage can. Cover your toilet of your life. Sorry. You know, don't let these things happen. And if they do, and they're going to, my life, your life, they're going to happen. Say, Lord, I, I need to fix that. No, let's not be a vomitorium for, for every weirdo out there to bring garbage into our lives. How foolish is that? You, you don't have to worry about these witches and these witch. You don't have to <coughs> stay out. You don't have to worry about these other things that people are doing. They should have no effect on us. But if the second half of verse 6 is what's going on in your life, you might be concerned about it. Harden not your heart. When God tells you something, don't look at what he must be talking about other people, not me. He's always talking about us. He says, when you're, he says remember, when your fathers were tempted, they tempted me, they proved me, and they saw my works 40 years on this two-week journey. Two weeks, two and a half weeks, however long it was, they say, to get people to the promised land. Forty long years. Why? Because of the second half of verse 6. He says, I was grieved with that generation. And I said, they err, they err in their hearts because they don't know my ways. Oh. I don't like this church. I don't like that. I don't like that. I don't like this person. That's the person that God's got in front of you because he's trying to clean you up. He said, I was grieved with that generation. Father, if any of us are erring our hearts, or, or I don't think any of us, Father, spiritually push up against the wall, Father, in Jesus' name. Lord, and... and if we're erring in our hearts, Father, if we're erring in our hearts, Lord, we don't want to change us. Show us where we need to repent. Show us where we need to fix the second part of verse 6 in our lives. God says, I swear in my wrath. They shall not enter into my rest. Period. Surprise, there's not an exclamation mark there. It's us. There's a rest that we have. Uh, you know, listen, you're no different than I am. You know, you've got all these things going on in your life. 
And if it wasn't for Jesus, we'd all be either on drugs or we'd be crazy or dead. All of us. None of us would survive. How does the world do it? Well, because their loss is a goose in a tornado. But knowing these things, thank God for Jesus Christ. Thank God that, that God knew we couldn't do anything ourselves to help us. So he gave us his son. He let his son go to the cross while we were still while we were still sinning to die for us. I think that's worth. God's just asking. You know, is that, is that worth anything for us? Or do you just want to ask Jesus in your life and go live your own life? Listen, you can't lose your salvation. The problem today isn't a loss of salvation. The problem today is salvation, period. Just so many, 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 many know a different Jesus than the one of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So let's continue on here of why the second half of verse 6 is there. God says, you're not going to enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any one of us an evil heart of unbelief that is going to cause us to depart from the living God. Because there's not one brother or sister here, unless you just got born again yesterday, that doesn't know that when we get away from the Lord, what happens? Our thoughts go bad, our actions go bad, everything goes haywire. And all it takes is Father in Jesus' name and poop. Father, I've sinned. Everything's restored. But the devil's so good at what he does in tricking us and deceiving us. That's why, that's why Paul said, I'm in fear. I'm in fear of all of you through the subtlety that the devil used on Eve, that he's going to corrupt our minds from the simplicity that's in Jesus. And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, there's nothing better than the simplicity in Christ, because that simplicity in Christ will teach us that he's got our back. And he'll take care of problems in our life. Even if they're not taken care of right away, we'll know we can trust the Lord. We're always trying to help the Lord. Listen, I was there. Well, I'm, not, I'm not talking because I don't know any of these things, because I didn't experience them in my own life. I made very poor choices in my Christianity from time to time. Lord, help me to not do that anymore. And when I do, Lord, help me to fix it. Help us all. But Father, if there is an if there is an evil heart of unbelief in our lives, I re, we rebuke that right now, and I command every spirit of doubt and unbelief, every spirit that drives us to doubt and unbelief, every spirit that drives us to operate and have an evil heart, an evil heart. Out of our heart come the issues of our lives. Proverbs teaches us, brothers and sisters. If any of us have an evil heart of unbelief, loose us. Get out of us right now in Jesus' name. I smite you with the blood of Jesus. Father, we, for each one of us, and Lord, not just here in church, but our friends, our loved ones, the whole church of Jesus Christ, Father, we send angels forth to inside, Father, cut, stick, stab, just make, make loose, make ready, Father, for these things to come out, this evil heart of unbelief that's driving us to error and false doctrine. We're driving, Father, we don't want to drive or fly to the, uh, uh, to the so-called, um, uh, I want to call it a reunion, uh, revival. We want that in our lives as we're sitting here right now or standing. Deliver us from evil heart of unbelief. Every spirit of doubt and unbelief, get out of us right now. Loose us and let's go. In Jesus name, we bind you with chains and fetters of iron. We execute upon you the judgments written in God's word. You come out of us. You come out from the inside, and you get out from around us right now in Jesus' name. Father, and as these things leave, Father, we pray for the Holy Spirit to go inside, make his home, Father, in that area. And if there's something we need to fix, Lord, help us to fix that so these things can't come back in. They can't look and see the house clean and swept. Nothing going on there. Let's come back in. Let Jesus be there, Father, in Jesus' name. Take heed, brethren, because, Father, if there be in any, any one of us, whoever us are, an evil heart of unbelief that is driving us to depart from you, Father. We confess that as sin, and we want that out of our lives, Father, even now in Jesus' name. But I admonish every one of us daily, while it is called right now, not tomorrow, right now, 
what is Jesus doing in your life, brothers and sisters? And if he's not doing anything, you better get jiggy with it. You better find out why. Oh, I just don't feel the Lord. How can you not feel the Lord? How can you not? Man, did you stick your finger? Did you ever stick your finger in a light socket? Did you ever get your finger pinched in a car door? I bet you rec I bet you knew it then, didn't you? I bet you remembered that, didn't you? I mean, did some catastrophe ever happen to you know that'll never leave your mind? How can you not know the Lord when He's taking you from darkness to light? When He's taking you from hell to heaven? How can you not know that? These spirits of deception, these spirits, Father, that, that are just covering our wisdom, knowledge, and understanding with all this deception and, and all these things that we have to do that you're not involved with God. Lord, deliver us from these things. We repent of these things right now in Jesus' name. Help us, Lord. We don't want the last part, the second part of verse 6. To be in our lives, because brothers and sisters, it doesn't have to be. It's not talking about salvation. It's talking about us being worthless before God. He sent his son while we were still sinning. He allowed his son to die for us. Well, I can drink because Paul told Timothy, you're just a liar. You're a liar is what you are. You drink because you like to. Just be honest. Don't make people have to read between the lines with you. Well, I do this and I do it. It's because you like it. Lord, help us to fall out of like right now. Well, I just, you know, I take a little bit at night. It helps calm me down. Do we need alcohol to calm us down? Do we need pot or some other drug to calm us down? If you do, you're living in the second half of verse 6. Repent of that. You're not hearing that word anywhere on the TV, on the re repent. Oh, I'm, yeah, there's a handful of people. But all the big names out there, there's no teeth in their gospel. Oh, how glorious Jesus is. But, you know, I, I had a long conversation with somebody yesterday, and, and he was like, you know, I love Jesus, and I know Jesus, and I've been involved in things of scripture and I've done so many things of what the word of God says and there's just something missing. These things aren't working. Well, that's because there's no deliverance in there. there there's no battling the enemy. Where, where's the devil? Jesus talks about them. The word of God warns us about these things. Where is he? I admonish you. The writer says here, God, admonish one another daily, encourage others while it is called today. Because when that next time comes, who knows? Lest any of us be hardened through what? Through the de deceitfulness of sin. That's why there's no revival. That's why we can't feel Jesus in our lives. There's there's a secret life. There's a secret sin because we like this, we like that. Paul says, I die daily. Father, if there is any hardening in our lives, Father, help us to deal with that. And Father, you restore our souls, Father. Restore our souls in these areas, Lord. And what, if we have to do something, Father, if there's sin in our lives, Lord, help us to deal with that. So these verses here covered the second half of verse six. So you don't you won't you won't be losing your salvation. Oh, you'll feel like you have, and you won't go to hell what verse 6 is saying, but you'll sure feel like you've been in it. Because Jewish brethren, be first century Jews, and every single one of us, we don't have to harden ourselves. If we do, it's because of the deceitfulness of sin. Because we are made partakers of Christ. Oh, there's that, that if again, 
if we hold the beginning of our conference dead fast to the end. It's the exact same thing that six is talking about. And these verses covered it. We won't have victory in our lives. We, we won't overcome drugs and alcohol and lust and, and, and evils in our lives and all these things that we hate, that we hate in our lives. They're never going to go anywhere, brothers and sisters, unless we deal with them God's way. Get them to the cross. Get them to Jesus. Get them to the Father in Jesus' name. Come before the throne of grace with boldness saying, God, I'm a mess. I think I'm something and I'm nothing. Help me, Lord. I want to be a partaker. I want to take part in Jesus. But we can't. If we're going to live our own lives and do whatever we want, and we're going to have the deceitfulness of sin, and and and, uh, and we're going to tempt God, well, you know, hey, it's, it comes from the first sin. It comes from the first thing that the devil said. Yea, did God say? He did say. And it means something. And if it doesn't mean anything to you, then go somewhere else. Get your help with with these word faithers or, or these these uh, people that call themselves prophets. Error and false doctrine, witchcraft, new age. I don't know if they're saved or not. It's really difficult to judge salvation. Because listen, a deceived person can preach the word of God. So why don't we try the spirits? Hmm. What is that in the Bible? Because if we try the spirit, we'll see which spirit it is. You know, if we want to take part in Jesus, we've got to hold the beginning of our confidence. When we got saved, wow. I mean, you know, listen, when I went from darkness to light, I knew it. I, a, lot, a million things I couldn't explain, but. I got a new life. And I didn't want to do those things anymore. I did until the Lord delivered me or I repented over. How about you? While it is said today, if you hear the Lord's voice, and he's been speaking to us through this whole chapter here, if you hear the Lord's voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. Well, God, I just feel like you're doing this in my life. And God's like, man, I, I got nothing to do with, you know, even the devil sometimes. I think sometimes we do things and the devil's like, whoa, I didn't even think of that one. How many, oh, our, our solemn meetings, oh, Shandala, oh, God, you are just, God's up in heaven vomiting. He's laughing at us. So today, if you'll hear his voice, harden not your hearts, just as they did in the provocation. For some, when they when they had heard, they provoked anyway. And that's why not all that came out of Egypt went in there by Moses. Not all. 99.99999999% of them didn't go in. It came out by Moses. But with whom was God grieved 40 years, question mark? Was it not with them that sinned and their carcasses? <laughs> Only King James. Their worthless bottoms fell in the wilderness. And to whom swore he that they should not enter in his rest? But to them that believe not. Because we want to help God. Well, God, you, you just don't know me. I, I need things this way. Oh, I need things that way. No, I, 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 I don't like that like that. I need, I need things like this. And we just don't trust the Lord. So we see that they could not enter into this rest because of unbelief, brothers and sisters. And that's where we all are, our lack of faith. And I know that the Copenhagens will tell you, you run up to them, I just don't, you know, I got this problem, that problem, or you just don't have enough faith. It, it's, I mean, it is the faith issue, but it's a sin issue. It's the sin that's left us open to demons. It's the sin issue that's left us open to all kinds of pollution coming into our lives. We're, we're just inundated. We're trying to bail our own lives to get through the day in our, in our right mind, much less do anything for the Lord. 
we've got sin in our lives. Lord, help us. Lord, help me. Father, I can't lead if I don't take care of things in my life. Lord, help me. Help all of us, Father. We need your help today. Father, we ask that you'd help us, us, our friends, our children, our loved ones, the whole body of Jesus Christ, that at the end of this service, at the end of this microcosm of time that we're giving you, God, because we've got so many other things going on in our lives. You got to go here, go there. I'm busy. Or I'm just too busy for you, God. But thank, thank, thanks for this hour and a half or two hours that I, that I gave you, God, today. Lord, help us all to come out of right now, Father. Better, closer, more dedicated, dealing with the things we need to deal with in our lives. Lord, and Father, if none of this stuff is in us, then your word encouraged us in an earlier verse to help others. Thank you, Father, for your son. Thank you, Father, that you've not discarded us. And if we've never asked this Jesus to come into our lives and save us from our sins, that's the most important decision we'll ever make. If you've never asked Jesus to come in your life and save you from your sin, you may have asked him to come in because you needed money, you needed help, you needed a job, you know, things were going haywire in your family. And the Lord may save you through, through those things. He does. But if we don't recognize the sin in our lives, that's what separates us from God. And it's what separates us today. God doesn't leave us. He just goes around us. You're not going to lose your salvation. And, and that, that'll be established. Listen, by the time we're done, I know it's a little bit longer in this chapter because of, of verse 6. By the time we're done with Hebrews, we're going to all clearly understand that Jesus, once for all, did went to the cross, and the reason that there's no more uh, rec there, there's no more repentance, uh, there's no more uh, uh, reconciliation, uh, but there's no more repentance is because Jesus did that. Now we have to let the Lord know because He wants us to know. That's what moms and dads do with the children. But we're not going to lose our salvation because Jesus took care of that. It's amazing. I mean, it's not it's not just amazing. It's mind boggling. Jesus took us in our salvation from hell to heaven. Say, well, I don't want to go there. Well, too bad. You're going. But if you're driven, harassed, and tormented, and this is producing a compulsive behavior in your life that is slowing down, stopping, or turning around your spiritual growth and progress, this is what demons are doing in the life of the believer. Jesus Christ gave us a remedy for evil spirits. In his word, he says, these signs shall follow them that believe. You know, we call it deliverance a ministry, but it's not. It's a calling. The whole church, everybody, should be doing deliverance. You can do it in your home. You can do it in your car. Literally, just by coming out of agreement, you, you say, wow, Lord, that's not right. I, I repent of that. And all you demons that are there, because get on me right now in Jesus' name. God will honor that. And sometimes they need to be thrown out. And that's, that's what we do at HBC. That's what you do in your home or other places also. Because they drive, they harass, they torment. They produce compulsive behavior, which slows down, stops, or turn around. Your spiritual growth and progress. So if you have a need, talk to the Lord about that today. I know Hegwish will go into high gear now uh, with everything. So I'm going to go ahead and close uh, my part of it. But I love y'all. Uh, and Lord willing, please pray. Lord willing. Uh, I, 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 I need some hugs. I, I need to see. I, I'm a visual. Uh, I love fellowship. And I need it. Pray for me. I love y'all. Lord willing, I'll see you here, there, or in the air.